Well, I hope we got something here. <laughs> <laughs> but please don't make me look like a joke. <laughs> Spoiler warning for Blonde, although nothing much really happens in that movie, so there isn't really that much to spoil. Also, content warning for all the things currently mentioned on screen. Blonde is a 2022 Netflix film directed by Andrew Dominic and starring Anna Diarmas in the role of Marilyn Monroe, the titular Blonde. The film is based on the 2000 fan fi sorry, I mean novel by the same name, written by Joyce Carol Oates depicting a fictionalized take on the life of the late Marilyn Monroe. In case the title didn't already tip you off, I hated this movie. It took me three different sittings over three days to even get through it. Because even setting its moral and ethical failure aside, it still didn't manage to even provide the basic level of entertainment needed to keep me engaged in any way. But I was kind of curious about like elements of it and how they would be handled so I trudged through it anyway. I've been curious about this film since its production began in 2019. I learned that it had been in the works for much longer than that, which seemed to increase the hype around it. Because why would a biopic really take that long to be in production? Even Elvis took less than this to get made, and that's a Baz Luhrmann movie. So, as someone who knew very little of Marilyn's life, past the conspiracy theories and the pop culture references that were like all bound to be tangentially aware of just by virtue of like engaging with the world around us, I was very intrigued by the concept of the movie. But as more started coming out about the film itself, my excitement and intrigue slowly transformed into apprehension. Because for as little as I knew about Marilyn's life, one thing had been made abundantly clear throughout the years. Marilyn was exploited throughout her life, but it got terribly worse after her death. And for as much as I was hoping this movie would do the opposite of that, that it would show the human beneath the headlines, that it would focus on the aspects of her that have not been discussed to death by the yellow press, every tidbit of news coming out about it seemed to suggest the opposite. Then the announcement that the movie had to be rated NC-17 fully set my expectations of what the movie was actually going to be. Just another exploitation fest of a sex symbol. Of the sex symbol. Another chance to dress a beautiful girl like Marilyn Monroe so people can reindulge in her abuse while they watch her fall apart and reduce her to nothing but their assumptions of who she must have been. The one-dimensional being everyone expected her to be rather than who she actually was. A real human being. A real person who had layers and nuance and contradictions. Who had beliefs and dreams and morals. The things that we all possess. The things that make us who we are. All the things these subpar recreations of her continue to strip her of. I hated this movie as a movie. I think it has no entertainment value, but I mostly hated what it did to Marilyn. I hated it so much that I went and sought out credible accounts of her actual life, credible biographies on her, just to ensure that the image the movie painted of her is not the one forever cemented in my mind. And because of that, I actually ended up hating the movie even more. Because however much I had assumed it misrepresented her, I wasn't even close to the true level of character assassination it partook in. And because I've already rattled on about how horrible this movie is to everyone who is willing to listen, I have summarized my grievances with the film into this ranty little piece instead. I even made a numbered list. So here, in true Jenny Nicholson fashion, is The Failure of Blonde. The list. As I already said, Blonde is an adaptation of the novel by the same name by Joyce Carol Oates. Blonde, the novel, when accurately represented, is described as a fictional account of Marilyn's life, which, right off the bat, is kind of a cause for concern. Oates insists that Blonde is a work of fiction. It is. And that it should not be viewed as biographical. It is not. Yet the novel is often referred to as biographical in many excerpts describing it. That discrepancy is already a problem, but things are just going to keep getting worse. My question is, if it is simply a fictionalized account of her life, if it is simply taking the details that we already knew and weaving them into a different story, the story the author wants them to be in, and presenting them in the way she wants to present them, and filling in the details the way she wants them to be filled, how is this any different from real people fanfiction? Because fanfiction about celebrities and real human beings very much does exist, in abundance. It's absolutely nothing new. Trust me, I would know. I was a Harry Bias directioner until 2014. Speaking of which, see, and after, they scrubbed all traces of Harry from this before its initial publication and its subsequent adaptation. 
Anything identifiable to him specifically had to be taken out. And the only remaining thing was like kind of the accent. Welcome to my favorite place. And yeah, obviously this is different on like a few levels, especially Harry still being alive and like legally protected. And after being an alternate universe fanfiction, that places him into a different reality. But at its very core, the concept itself is the same. Blonde is like if After had been published with Harry's name and tattoo descriptions still all over it. How odd and dehumanizing would that have been? Because if you take away all the details and get to the core of it all, this is Marilyn fanfiction being published, being monetized, and then being turned into a movie to be monetized further, without changing the name, without preserving her image. Taking these fictionalized events that the author came up with to fill in her characterization of this real human being, who already had her own character and didn't need anyone else to make one up for her, and adapting it for general audiences. Commodifying a fictional version of this person's life, without affording her the courtesy of even slightly altering the name or the likeness. And I have nothing against the author Joyce Carol Oates, personally. I hear she's a very talented writer. If she had an AO3 account, I'm sure I would have left her kudos. And even though the mere act of the publication of this novel to critical acclaim while being under a real person's name is already pretty, like, iffy to me, its adaptation into a movie is so much worse. Because it's always a fair assumption to make that the movie will reach a broader audience, since movies are a lot more accessible as a medium, especially when put on the largest streaming platform, easily the most accessible form of entertainment we have right now. Being this much more accessible inevitably means reaching a much wider sect of audience, a large part of whom is most likely completely uninterested in doing further research or verifying the facts presented in the movie they're watching. Reading books is an act of active consumption, and I often find myself thinking through the information I am being fed by books a lot more thoroughly than any information I consume passively through movies or television. In visual media, be it movies or TV, the act of associating information with visual imagery that is readily presented to you cements their connection in your brain a lot easier, without as much active effort being expended into the processing of what you are consuming. Adapting this fanfiction twice now. This is the second adaptation of it, but this one is like so much easier to gain access to. And visually tying this fairly close visual representation of Marilyn with all these unverifiable, largely fictional, and out of character events with the real person whose name they are exploiting is one of the most disrespectful acts this movie engages in. And I'm kind of saying this with confidence because I know what happened to everyone I forced to watch this movie with me um, because I needed them to hold me accountable for getting through it. And I know for a fact this happened to me. Even though I went into this movie with all this pre-built apprehension, consciously keeping in mind that it's not an actual biopic and that a lot of it was fiction, I still found myself losing grip of that fact during the few occasions when the movie had me invested in its plot. It's just so much easier, so much more automatic for your brain to process things the way they are presented, especially visually, and especially when I had no prior knowledge of which parts were completely made up and which were based in truth. I still mostly found myself lamenting the sad life Marilyn must have lived, not so much empathizing with the character on screen as much as I was empathizing with the idea of the person she was based on. And yeah, Marilyn did live a pretty sad life, but it was not the one we saw in the movie. And a big part of that confusion comes from the fact that the movie does not try to draw your attention to the detail that it's not an acrobiopic at all. There's no disclaimer at the start of the movie about this being fictional or even partly fictionalized accounts of a life or anything remotely similar to that. From the beginning, we get a date and a location, a real place and a real time that situate us in the real world. And while that's done with movies all the time, pairing that with the usage of a real person as your protagonist, and it immediately feels like a statement that this movie is grounding itself in actual history, in Marilyn's actual life, when that is simply not true. Not true enough, at least. After this movie, I read like a textbook called biopics um it's from 1992 but it's like mostly on the creation of biopics in hollywood and how they're used to frame public perception a lot of the stuff the book says is kind of like useful here so i'm just going to be quoting it a few times although most biopics make only limited claims to be treated as the final word on their subject neither are they meant to be ignored as useful historical materials in biopics as i define them the characters real names are used while working on this video, I debated with myself multiple times if I should actually read Blonde to see what was presented in it and how it was changed from page to screen. I wrestled with this so much that I even checked the book out from my library twice, only to have the time lapse on it while I was busy arguing with myself. In the end, I decided that it really does not matter. 
It does not matter how the adaptation changed the source material, because the affront is the source material being fictional at all, when there is a plethora of well-researched biographies on the life Marilyn actually lived, and the person Marilyn actually was, that could have been adapted instead, even one written by Marilyn herself. But instead, they went with one that, by the author's own admission, is probably furthest from that. So, to rectify this, I decided to read Marilyn's incomplete autobiography, My Story, instead. I also read Gloria Steinem's incredibly well-researched and well-written biography on her title, Norma Jean. That one even has, like, references and direct quotes and directly pulls from Marilyn's autobiography constantly. Imagine sources in a biographical work. Amazing. I tried. I tried really hard to grapple with the why of it. Why is this the choice that was made? Why not just be inspired by the dramatic aspects known of her life, write the fanfiction you want, but have enough respect for her to keep her name out of it, like countless others have done before, and will probably continue to do? Why not have that modicum of respect for her? Part of the reason I watched this movie was just to research for an answer to my question. I can't ask a question like that and then just not consume the actual work, the only thing that could give me the answer I was looking for. I was trying to see if their insistence on fabricating events pertaining to the life of a real dead person had any artistic merit, even if you're willing to set your morals aside. And I'm sorry if I missed it, but to me there was none. No artistic merit whatsoever. The only explanation I could come up with for a decision like that is that the similarities were too deliberate and blatant, that if it had gone under a fictional name, if it admitted it was about a fictional person, not Marilyn at all, it would not be viewed as this exciting take on a biopic, fictionalizing the real and well-explored life of an icon. It would have just been another mediocre, shallow exploration of trauma, vaguely based on the life of the most iconic sex symbol that failed to even develop her into a three-dimensional character. Marilyn's name was The Pull. It was an excuse for them to tell a story that they wanted to tell, completely independent of her, that did not have enough to stand on its own without exploiting her. And at the end of the day, it's just not worth it. The fictionalization in the movie is wildly misleading, relying on the audience's tendency to see a recognizable name and a face that looks vaguely like hers and just making the connection, while it refuses to put any effort into presenting the actual person as she was. Putting most of their effort instead into emulating her likeness, into presenting the visual connection, and Anna does look a lot like Marilyn, and she tries to sound and act like her too. Obviously, you usually want that from a biopic, but in this one, it feels misleading and like a shortcut instead of an advantage. The fact that real names are used in biographical films suggests an openness to historical scrutiny and an attempt to present the film as the official story of a life. And, while such openness may indeed be opposed by a film's producers, it nevertheless is publicly presented as a natural state of film narration. Hollywood biopics are the true versions of a life. This decision to both not abide by what is actually true about her life and to not give her name the dignity of not being involved in this is what makes it clear that this is not about Marilyn at all. This is not about respecting her or telling her story or preserving her memory. This is about artistic hubris, people putting their shallow art above the real life and trauma of an actual human being. In 1974, another one of those movies that is very clearly based on Marilyn, but refrained from using her name, came out. Not using her name already puts them leaks and bounds above blonde in my eyes. Despite the extremely exploitative and sexualized light, it also puts the Marilyn stand-in in. It was very clearly based on the most scandalous bits of Marilyn's life, with a healthy dose of fictional sprinkled in there. Once again, not unlike the one this whole video is about. That movie was titled, The Sex Symbol. That's what Marilyn is to the public. She is not a sex symbol, she is the sex symbol. And that is the primary and basically only lens blonde decides to look at her through. But that status, the designation, is only for the public eye. That was how the public perceived her and how she was marketed, an overtly sexual bombshell. In her own private life, based on her own retelling, she was far from that. In fact, there is an argument to be made for Melon being borderline asexual, or somewhere on that scale. In her book, My Story, in one of the surprisingly plentiful instances of her discussing her lack of interest in sex and her confusion regarding others' fascination by it, she states, Why I was a siren, I hadn't the faintest idea. There were no thoughts of sex in my head. Then she continues, The truth was that, with all my lipstick and mascara and precocious curves, I was as unsensual as a fossil. 
I want to say up front that I don't necessarily find it right to state her sexuality for her while she's never said anything on the topic. I don't want to speculate on it too much either because it actually doesn't matter what label we decide to retroactively slap on her. I think we can just take her words as they are and understand what she was trying to say, especially when her statements are supported by observations the people in her life made. In Gloria Steinem's book, she states, By her own testimony to friends and from that of lovers, she never, or rarely, had orgasms. Or rarely. Trigger warning. Again, while still trying to make sure to never give her a label she never claimed herself, it's fairly easy to tell that Marilyn's relationship with sex was not a wild and passionate one, like is often portrayed. And while trying not to psychoanalyze a dead person, it could be beneficial to think of that alongside the context of a sexual assault she experienced as a child. Marilyn tells the story like this in her autobiography, and I need to quote it verbatim here, the way it was told by her, since it is her story to tell and I want to make sure I don't accidentally embellish or omit anything or mess it up. I will also leave a timestamp right here you can go to if you want to skip the retelling because it is honestly quite triggering. At night, I lay awake and tried to figure out what sex was and what love was. I wanted to ask a thousand questions, but there was no one to ask. Besides, I knew that people only told lies to children. Lies about everything from soup to Santa Claus. Then one day I found out about sex without asking any questions. I was almost nine, and I lived with a family that rented a room to a man named Kimmel. He was a stern-looking man, and everybody respected him and called him Mr. Kimmel. I was passing his room when his door opened, and he said quietly, Please come in here, Norma. I thought he wanted me to run an errand. Where do you want me to go, Mr. Kimmel? I asked. No place, he said, and closed the door behind me. He smiled at me and turned the key in the lock. Now you can't get out, he said, as if we were playing a game. I stood staring at him. I was frightened, but I didn't dare yell. I knew if I yelled, I would be sent back to the orphanage in disgrace again. Mr. Kimmel knew this too. When he put his arms around me, I kicked and fought as hard as I could, but I didn't make any sound. He was stronger than I was and wouldn't let me go. He kept whispering to me to be a good girl. When he unlocked the door and let me out, I ran to tell my aunt what Mr. Kimmel had done. I want to tell you something, I stammered, about Mr. Kimmel. My aunt interrupted. Don't you dare say anything against Mr. Kimmel, she said angrily. Mr. Kimmel's a fine man. He's my star boarder. Mr. Kimmel came out of his room and stood in the doorway, smiling. Shame on you. My aunt glared at me, complaining about people. This is different. I began. This is something I have to tell. I started stammering again and couldn't finish. Mr. Kimmel came up to me and handed me a nickel. Go buy yourself some ice cream, he said. I threw the nickel in Mr. Kimmel's face and ran out. I cried in bed that night and wanted to die. I thought, if there's nobody ever on my side that I can talk to, I'll start screaming. But I didn't scream. I'm sharing this not just to highlight the trauma she did experience that the movie decides to just not even discuss, but because it could be useful when looking at Marilyn's views on sex and her borderline aversion to it, or at least her inability to experience it fully, the way many other people can. Henry Rosenfeld, a New York dress manufacturer who met her in her early 20s and remained a close friend until her death, explained that Marilyn thought sex got you closer, made you a closer friend. She told me she hardly ever had an orgasm, but she was very unselfish. And yet, even with this background of her experiences available to the public and requiring minimal research, Marilyn's sexuality and sexual endeavors are portrayed in an extremely exaggerated light in the movie. Her shifts in personality seem to almost exclusively be tied to the sexual experiences she has, ones that don't make sense once you know of what she was actually like in her background. Like the inclusion of this fictional triad she has with the movie's version of Charlie Chaplin Jr. and Eddie Robinson Jr. And the incredibly explicit sex scenes we are given regarding a relationship that appears to have no basis in reality. I wasn't exaggerating when I said fanfiction, this is like giving the Twilight smile I read in high school a run for its money. This movie really decides to dedicate a good amount of time to this completely random fabrication that paints Marilyn as a hypersexual being who needs two men to be guided through the sexual awakening that leads to what seems to be her only time feeling happy and carefree in the movie. The worst part is the scene where she's in a movie theater. She's watching herself on screen, her literal biggest dream and her life's goal. But in the movie's version of Marilyn, she still needed to engage in a little bit of exhibitionism. I 
that's a word and I hope I'm saying that right, to feel any excitement. Because in this version of Marilyn, her career is an afterthought to her sex drive. It's all just so far from how she describes herself, her experience, and her views on sex. And so far from how the people around her describe her too. It's made even worse when taking into account that this is the first consensual sexual act we see her engage in in the movie. I had to pause and come back to this paragraph like multiple times and had to rewrite it from scratch a couple of times because it's, it's very hard to process how f up it is that this got made at all. This whole movie is just completely ignoring the real person behind the public persona, beneath the manufactured image, and completely altering her private life and experiences to fit their family of her and what they wanted her to be. It's very hard to just, like, I can't think of reasons to justify this. And the first actual sexual experience she has on screen is infinitely worse. It's a blatant rape scene with who is meant to be a Hollywood executive. And if taken literally, this did not happen. If taken as an allusion to her falling victim to any version of the casting couch in general, um, something to that effect probably did take place. But even if we're generous and we go with the second interpretation, the way this movie portrays the event feels extremely wrong still. It still feels disrespectful somehow. And not only because they included a at all, one that did not happen literally, like in the literal sense, not like literally did not happen, just did not happen in the literal sense. And not because I have a hard time in general justifying a male director's decision to include a rape scene in his movie 99% of the time, but part of the reason this scene is one of the worst things the movie does, to me, besides how unnecessarily graphic it is, is that its characterization of Marilyn herself fails. That she had to be turned into a clueless damsel in distress, shock and surprise, rendering her completely speechless. I met them all. Phoniness and failure were all over them. Some were vicious and crooked, but they were as near to the movies as you could get. So you sat with them, listening to their lies and schemes, and you saw Hollywood with their eyes, an overcrowded brothel, a merry-go-round with bets for horses. I had a hard time pinpointing exactly what it was about the part with her leaving the room that pissed me off almost as much as the scene itself. I had an even harder time putting that into words. So I'm gonna try to be as delicate and as clear as possible here while attempting to talk through one of my issues with it. I think it's because it feels like even in this situation, which is conceptually rooted in reality and where what happens to her is a horrendous act, whether it's the way it's portrayed in the movie or the concept of her being taken advantage of by men in power in real life. Even with all that, it feels like the movie somehow takes it a step further and strips her of all of her agency. It strips her of her agency, of her intelligence, of her awareness to make her into the image of the perfect victim that some people seem to need in order to feel any sympathy for abused women. It's like the movie saying that the act is only this horrific because Marilyn is a naive little child who knows nothing of the world and is just in shock at what Hollywood is actually like. You're in. You're cast. If your name is Marilyn Monroe. Yes, that's me. But, but, but I don't understand. The truth is Marilyn knew exactly how Hollywood operated and she fought against all of it constantly. In Hollywood, a girl's virtue is much less important than her hairdo. You're judged by how you look, not what you are. Hollywood's a place where they'll pay you a thousand dollars for a kiss and 50 cents for your soul. I know, because I turned down the first offer often enough and held out for the 50 cents. And this is where things will get kind of muddy. I want to clarify exactly what I mean by my issue here. Um, so do clarify. I'm not saying that because Marilyn knew and was a fighter, um, that makes what she experienced what she probably experienced in any way any less of an assault. Quite the opposite, actually. I'm saying that the movie, in its choice to paint her in this naive, uninformed light, far from who she was in real life, makes it seem like it is saying that her awareness and her resilience are contradictory to the image of the victim that she was. Which is not true and kind of an extremely harmful message to send. A strong, resilient, and informed victim is still a victim. Her knowledge of what was coming and how the world in Hollywood worked does not mean experiencing it was any less traumatizing and horrific. But this portrayal, the way the movie decides to alter her character, feels wrong. It's harmfully infantilizing. Her knowledge and her awareness of what she was up against in Hollywood does not make what she was subjected to any less disgusting or appalling. And the movie deciding to take those away from her, as it continues to do, is just sending the message that she needs to be infantilized in order to be a victim. She did not have to be made so much more clueless and gullible than she actually was for her to inspire sympathy in us, for us to feel sickened for her and to feel her pain. In spite of how men at the time, 
and till now, seemed determined to see her. Marilyn was not a child. She was a smart and capable person, which does not make her abuse any less harrowing to witness, especially considering that the movie completely skipped over the sexual abuse she did experience as a child. It's kind of all just generally awful, like that this is all we see of her actual race to stardom. Marilyn went through years and years of borderline poverty and hardships and dedication and perseverance that are completely skipped over. But in the movie, we see her get raped and that's it. Suddenly, she's unlocked all the doors that were shut to her. Suddenly, she's made it, like an on and off switch, when the real Marilyn had to go through so much on top of that. And the truth of the way it all works is far from that. Women got, and still get, exploited and abused in Hollywood every day for nothing. And even Marilyn herself explicitly stated this very thing once. As she is quoted from an interview in Gloria Steinem's book, saying to W.J. Weatherby, a British journalist, You can't sleep your way into being a star, though. It takes much, much more. But it helps. A lot of actresses get their first chance that way. Most of the men are such horrors, they deserve all they can get out of them. And the biography makes the comment, Marilyn supplied so that she would be allowed to work, but not that so she wouldn't have to work. But the most explicit instance of this movie using Marilyn to feed into male fantasies and reducing her into nothing but a sexual object is the scene with the JFK stand-in. I think anyone who's seen this movie knows the exact moment I'm referring to which is just indicative of how awful it is. I'm honestly kind of scared to even include it here at all, but like if if I were to try to describe it in words, it's like a POV of a Half of this is going to get censored when I'm editing because that whole sentence won't work on YouTube. Um, but it's like cropped and edited to ensure that it wouldn't be classified as straight up porn, although that's basically what it is. And I feel like the movie kind of really showed its hand here. Uh, like, that's it. That's what the objective was. It feels like you get a Marilyn POV in a scene where, within the narrative, she's being coerced. And yeah, there you go. If it was meant to induce terror regarding the act itself, it failed. It did not frame it in the terrorizing light it is meant to be in. This is how porn is shot. If it's meant to be inducing terror and disgust at the fact that we're watching this, that we are watching a dead woman's memory and legacy be desecrated in the most horrifying and explicit way possible, then yeah, it succeeded at that, but at what cost? And the movie does kind of play into that second interpretation, like it pans out and we see the scene we were just watching on a darkened movie screen and the Armas in the voiceover discussing playing the role of the blonde actress. Except that does not take away from what the movie just did, like lampshading the exploitation they just partook in, making it clear that they're aware of what they're doing, and making it seem like that was the point. It doesn't really take away from the act itself. It does not take away from the fact that the making of this did not carry within it an ounce of respect for the blonde actress. The movie affords her no humanity. It is using her to make a point. A dumb point that is not well written, one that is somehow both not communicated well enough, but also not subtle at all. A point that is lost amongst all the countless other dumb decisions the movie makes. And I just have to go back to the point that this could have been anyone else. In fact, should have been anyone else. The more I think about the decisions this movie makes, the clearer it is that the usage of Marilyn's name was needed. Just so this would be referred to as that Marilyn biopic. So it has an excuse to exist. So they have a vessel to tell their story. This movie is not about Marilyn. It's not about who Marilyn was. Not about her dreams or ambitions or actual trauma or her motivations. It's not about what she should be remembered by. It's not about any of that. It's about what the people who made it wanted her to be. It's about their stories, what they wanted to say, while she's once again rendered helpless and silenced in a retelling of her own life story. As I said before, Marilyn is incredibly one-dimensional in this movie. Maybe even like zero-dimensional, is that a thing? She has no dimension. She's barely a fully formed character. And it's so sad because the real-life Marilyn seemed to have been like an incredibly layered person, like an utterly fascinating enigma to the people around her and even to herself. And there are more than enough anecdotes from the people in her life and even more from her own accounts of herself to try to build the complexity of her character into a movie. But instead, all she's presented as is a tortured, hypersexual blonde with severe daddy issues and the naivety of a child. Naivety. When I first typed out the sentence, I said actress instead of blonde to refer to Marilyn, but then I realized that that's far too generous for the way she's painted in this movie. Marilyn as an actress is nothing but an afterthought, despite it being her life's work and one of the things she took the most pride in and what she focused the most on. As she states in her book, Acting was something golden and beautiful. 
It was like the bright colors Norma Jean used to see in her daydreams. It wasn't an art, it was like a game you played that enabled you to step out of the dull world you knew into worlds so bright they made your heart leap just to think of them. That's the way it was when I sat alone in my Hollywood room. I went to sleep hungry and woke up hungry, and I thought all actors and actresses were geniuses sitting on the front porch of paradise, the movies. Yet the narrative Blonde presents completely omits her professional life, unless it tangentially connects to whatever is causing her trauma at the moment. Whether it's being pregnant or being hopped up on drugs, it most egregiously omits the struggle that she spent the majority of her life making her way out of. The struggle of coming from absolutely nothing and growing to be one of the biggest stars of her time, and one of the most recognizable names of all time. Instead, the movie centers the narrative entirely around the female aspects of who she is, like her sexual partners, her miscarriages, and her weird, fake correspondence she has with her dad that literally never happened in real life, but somehow seems to have her emotional state anchored to it, and seems to be such a pivotal factor in a lot of the biggest events in her life. Which once again brings me right back to, then why make it about Marilyn? Instead of just making it about some fictional character you made up, since you're already most of the way there. The way the movie treats Marilyn as an actress would be like if Elvis decided to only ever show you an Elvis performance kind of playing in the background, like on the TV in the background where you can't even see it. Never discussing his career, never discussing the shifts in his approach, never even mentioning how he like broke out or what people liked about him or how he honed his craft. If Baz Luhrmann treated Elvis the way Andrew Dominic treated Marilyn, the movie would have been 20 minutes long. It's very easy to showcase the struggles that someone has gone through without reducing them to just that, without making that their entire identity, without discounting their years of hard work and perseverance. It's so easy, but Blonde made the conscious choice not to do that. Not only does the movie gloss over Marilyn's career and livelihood and the thing that probably dictated a majority of her existence, it at times makes it look like she actively hates it, like she gets no joy out of it, like she resents her success and the fact that she made it as an actress, which is just wild. This lack of respect for Marilyn's career, which she continuously refers to as essential in her life, as she is quoted in Steinem's biography saying, My work is the only ground I've ever had to stand on, she had told a magazine writer that final summer. Makes sense when we hear what Andrew Dominic, the orchestrator behind most of this, had to say about Marilyn's films. She's somebody who's become this huge cultural thing in a whole load of movies that nobody really watches, right? Does anyone watch Marilyn Monroe movies? I mean, I do. A lot of my colleagues and friends do. Gentlemen prefer Blondes as one we watch a lot. Really? What is it about? It has a worldview that is quite cynical about men and gender relations in a way that I think a lot of contemporary young women like, and it affords Marilyn's character the credit of her wit. She gets one of menship on men. She is not a dumb blonde, not really. It's cynical about women too, though. Yes, maybe, but it's glamorous. It's a fantasy. What, because they're well-dressed? Sure. They're well-dressed whores. I don't know. And it all just clicks into place, doesn't it? How can Marilyn's career be portrayed with the love she had for it? How can they focus on how hard she worked to get where she was if the person making the movie had absolutely no respect for what she did? They had to reduce her career to a footnote, turn it into a joke, turn the thing she referred to as the only ground she's ever had to stand on into a negative, as something she resents, something she does not enjoy, because he has no respect for it, because in his eyes it was a joke. This interview actually gets me so hate. I need like a second here. Enjoy this quick clip of Marilyn in All About Eve while I scream to Apollo. I'm afraid Mr. DeWitt would find me boring before too long. You won't bore him, honey. He won't even get a chance to talk. Claudia, come here. You see that man? That's Max Fabian, the producer. Now go and do yourself some good. Why do they always look like unhappy rabbits? Because that's what they are. Go and make him happy. Okay, we're pivoting a bit here. Even the other characters in her life, some of whom could be argued could have been like categorized as villainous in the narrative sense, are given more nuance to their character and their motivations than Marilyn herself got. I think nowhere is that more offensive than with the Joe DiMaggio stand-in. Joe DiMaggio is Marilyn's second husband and is referred to in the movie subtly as the ex-baseball player. Because once again, everyone in this movie is afforded a modicum of respect through implied anonymity and their names not being plastered all over it, except for Marilyn herself. Anyway, it is said that Marilyn's relationship with DiMaggio was fairly controlling and not at all healthy. Everything I mentioned about this relationship is like alleged, but based on biographies I've read, um, supposedly he was vehemently opposed to Marilyn being sexualized, but like he also seemed to kind of blame her for it. He made her change the way she dressed and wanted to interfere with her career and the way her movies were being made, made her in a more like demure and conservative light, I guess. And it does appear that threatening to interfere with her career was like a kind of a big thing for Marilyn. 
And the movie almost gets it right. It depicts his controlling nature in the relationship. We even get to see a rare moment of actual character building for Marilyn when she's having a conversation with DiMaggio and strays off and starts talking about her career and her ambitions. But then she notices the turn the conversation took appears to have made him unhappy, so she reverts back to talking about settling down. It's a very rare moment where we get a look into the things that led to her discomfort in discussing her professional aspirations. Except the movie, or the book, or both, manages to fuck it all up in like a weird storytelling decision. And also a weird, like, ethical decision. In this version of the reality that never happened, Chaplin and Robinson come back to the story multiple times, and each time seems worse than the last. And I want to make sure to reiterate once again, there's pretty much no evidence or speculation that this relationship, this triad, even happened the way the story wants to convince you that it did. Just want to make sure this is clear, it's fresh in our minds. Okay. Here they come back with blackmail nudes of Marilyn, which is a ridiculous statement that I have to type out, fully knowing none of this happened. Like, just straight up, it did not happen. And yeah, most of the movie is fictional, so at that point it's like, whatever. But this specific decision gave me pause. Because why? Why make this up specifically when there's an instance that already exists in real life that illustrates Marilyn's character far better? Here's the story. Even the car at that point is a fucking army. Marilyn was asked to pose nude so many times, and it's widely known that the single time she accepted that offer was for a calendar that eventually got widely circulated after she hit stardom. The reason behind her choice to accept the offer that single time is stated very plainly in her autobiography, and affirmed through research and other biographies about her. Marilyn struggled a lot in her early years in Hollywood, and was often barely able to make ends meet. But the one thing that finally pushed her to accept that specific offer was losing her car. She knew that without her car, she could not get to auditions, and so the one thing she had been working towards would be affected. She accepted the offer to pose nude and asked for exactly the amount of money she needed to get her car back, exactly $50. It is also said that she was a consummate professional throughout the whole shoot, where the photographer's wife was actually present. And when it was done, she took the money and got her car back, and that was that, until the pictures came out later. For such a brief little anecdote, I feel like this reveals so much of Marilyn's character and who she was. And it's already written! They didn't even have to make anything up to try to illustrate who Marilyn was through an event that can play out on screen. Marilyn did the work for them. Anyway, they clearly went a different route. These are not those pictures. This is not when that happened, she was not married to DiMaggio when they came out, and they were in no way used to blackmail her from an ex or anything like that. And most importantly, when they did come out, she did not need anyone to save her. She handled it herself, encouraging the studio to be upfront with the truth and being sincere and sympathetic with her own statements. She was even charming at times. And here's like a quote. Later, reporters would harangue Marilyn and ask her if she had anything on during the infamous shoot. Oh yes, Marilyn quipped, I had the radio on. She's so funny. In fact, her handling of it on her own was so exemplary that it's said that it's the entire reason she survived a scandal like that, which at the time was basically career ending. So knowing all this just really made me wonder about the timing of this weird fictional plot element and the way they told it. Because after that happens in the movie, like the whole blackmail thing, DiMaggio gets even more controlling over Marilyn in the way she dresses and the way she acts and the way she's portrayed in movies and eventually resorting to physical violence. And this sucks. They made this whole thing up, completely cut out an actual event from Marilyn's life because it would paint Marilyn as smart and capable and resourceful and charming and God forbid would do any of that in this movie, but made this whole other thing up with echoes of it and then adjusted it to fit their narrative and build up this motivation for why he escalates physical abuse. It sucks. It sucks. This sucks. These people suck. I had another break. Here's Marilyn again. Some people don't catch on to Dorothy's jokes. I'm gonna try. That's good. Dorothy's the best and loyalest friend a girl ever had. She'll make some man a wonderful wife. You'll find out. It is actually very widely speculated that DiMaggio was physically Marilyn was seen with bruises multiple times during their marriage. But these pictures never happened. So in reality, he was but he spiraled into abuse with no clear-cut definitive event to trigger it. Nothing to directly point at and say, that's what did it for him. And this sounds really obvious when I say it like this because that's what most abusers do. He did not need Marilyn to give him a reason. He would have found a reason on his own. They all do. But they had to invent this whole thing, one that seemed to put Marilyn and her fictional decision making and her fictional crappy relationship squarely at the center of the blame. It's such a concerning decision. Because yeah, right now, from the perspective I'm writing this from, there is nothing wrong with Marilyn partaking in any of these things. If she was a fictional character, I would be cheering for her and her sexually liberated relationship. But she's not. Marilyn is not a fictional character. And attributing her partner's real escalation to physical abuse to a fictional action that she never took, when most of the pivotal decisions she did take are hardly even explored in this movie, it's just garbage. 
And what's worse is the movie doesn't even give me a chance to cheer for her even if I wanted to. Because following the scene with the movie frames as the Majid's breaking point and we thankfully don't have to see what he does afterward but we like hear it which kind of still sucks. Anyway, following that we don't even get to see her leave him. We don't get to see her moment of triumph. The news is told to us in a voiceover delivered by another of the men in her life. One that she and we assume is her father but is actually like the guy's faking correspondence from him again literally what the fuck is going on with this movie at no point during the movie do we get to see her take her power back in any way we are constantly exposed to her abuse and exploitation especially because her whole entire career is framed as nothing but exploitation we hear her actual abuse for far too long while fictional letters from the father she never knew and who wasn't actually her father casually let us know that she did the one thing that is often the most difficult to do for an abused victim and we don't even see her when that news is being delivered. No attention is brought to it as an act of bravery. It's mentioned literally while we are listening to her be abused off screen. We are forced to see her beg and grovel and get hurt, while the instances that should be highlighted the most, the ones that clearly showcase her strength of character, are mentioned in one sentence, delivered by the disappointed voice of someone else. I know I don't need to say it, but leaving an abusive relationship takes a great deal of strength. And leaving such a public relationship, especially with someone who is beloved by the people, especially for the time, required even more strength, probably more than I can succinctly state. But that does not fit the image of her the movie is painting, so it refuses to even let her have this moment. It refuses to frame her walking away as the moment of strength it deserved to be. The motif of women ennobled by suffering is a continuation of male dominance fantasies from the studio era. And while still referring to the portrayal of women in biopics, he says, For many of the TV films, the subject matter is suffering or victimization, a view of a life that reduces a career to cries of pain and not gestures of work. Blonde was ultimately only interested in the parts of Marilyn that made her appeal to the masculine gaze. And it didn't even do those well. It seemed to have no interest in exploring what actually shaped her, or in showcasing her resilience and grit in coming as far as she had in life, or in walking away from situations that hurt her. It omits the instances in her life that can be deemed as unsexy or could be contradictory to the image of her that the movie is trying to convey and didn't seem interested in dealing with her trauma except in the ways that affected her sexually. And on that note, let's talk about the daddy issues. Daddy? 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 Am I your good girl? Daddy? Daddy? From what we do know about Marilyn, the actual Marilyn, her daddy issues are kind of undeniable and for good reason. But somehow, what is that fucking plane? But somehow, even when the movie gets a few of the details regarding that right, it still manages to fuck it up. It frames it in such a superficial manner, reducing Marilyn to a child in the process. The image everyone needed or still needs her to have, that she possessed the mind of a child in the body of a beautiful woman. Like, we really need to examine why that's the ideal people seem to strive for so desperately. And it's just sad because that wasn't her. That was the persona the public wanted from her, the one she had to put on. But in a movie purporting to be about Marilyn, this should not be the only portrayal of her we get. The child within her needing love was absolutely an aspect of Marilyn's personality, an aspect that seemed to live in her so regularly that she would refer to it as Norma Jean living inside her. Especially in relationships, that part of her personality was even more prominent, and had the movie presented Marilyn overall as a well-rounded character who had any depth, their handling of her daddy issues and the way they were incorporated into the story would have made sense. But Marilyn here is, like we said, barely one-dimensional. And this is the only dimensionality her character gets. She is stripped of any other identity. She is never discussed as the girl who forced herself to make connections and go to events, despite hating the atmosphere but continuously working and striving to make herself visible to the people who mattered. She is never discussed as the girl who is vehemently denying marriages for money, even at her most desperate, because despite everything, she still fiercely believed that marriage had to be for love and love only. She is stripped of all the aspects that built her character, that made her her, not child her, adult her. Grown-up Marilyn, whose inner Norma Jean was merely an aspect of her, part of her personality, and not the whole picture. Merely her inner child with her trauma still residing somewhere inside her, peeking her head out every now and then, just as to be loved and cared for. Marilyn's childhood is framed almost entirely through that image of her father that is set up in the opener, which did exist in real life but is given like a weird amount of emphasis here. It's actually mentioned very early on in her autobiography and like a part of me, a not insignificant part of me, thinks Oates or like maybe Dominic, I don't know. Started reading Marilyn's autobiography, only got like 20 pages in, and submitting a school book report on a book they only read a small portion of, decided to center their whole narrative on what they did manage to read. 
Or the more sinister assumption is that someone read the beginning of her autobiography and then decided that they could do it better. Do her life better. Because this is basically the only thing mentioned as an experience that shaped her, but everything afterwards, everything in her formative years, everything that molded her into the person she ended up being, is completely skipped over. And for some reason, we cut from Marilyn being dropped off at the orphanage, just straight to her getting c***ed, with no suggestion of who the person that was formed in between these two events is. As if those are the only events that happened to her that shaped her personality. I've written background characters with more fleshed out backstories than this. Like I said, the things this movie chooses to unnecessarily focus on and the things it chooses to inexplicably omit, despite their obvious vitality to her character, are all just kind of telling. This brings me to the weird fictional correspondence between her and her father, who is not actually her father, but is another weird fictional relationship made up for the movie. I also wrote a paragraph about this part three times and all three were just like 90% me being confused and angry and kind of losing track of my sentences and my sentences were cutting into each other and a lot of it was cuss words. So I'm just going to keep this brief for the sake of not descending into chaos again. It's stupid. It's a stupid storytelling decision that makes no sense and it's very annoying because every element involved in this creation never actually existed. It also angers me because it's just a very weird thing to make up and then choose to center so many of her real life decisions around it and the timing of the instances where it's given a lot of emphasis is weird. I just don't understand the need to use this weird device that has absolutely no connection to real life to frame Marilyn's state of mind in connection to events that actually did happen to her. It's like no effort was put into trying to figure out how the real Marilyn would process things or why she would make the decisions she made, so a made-up narrative device had to be introduced to explain things again and reduce all her decisions and outbursts and feelings to her daddy issues. The way the movie grasps onto that flimsy thread and seems to even connect her own death to it, when it literally had absolutely nothing to do with any of this because it did not exist in real life. Especially when there's a first-hand account confirming that her father already dismissed her and disappointed her by cutting off ties when she tried to reach out to him earlier in life before she got famous. From Steinem's biography, Jim Doherty was very aware of his role. When Norma Jean was told about her illegitimacy before their marriage, she determined to get in touch with her real father, the handsome, idealized man she had known only as a photograph. This is Norma Jean, Jim remembered her saying in a tremulous voice when she finally got the courage to phone the fantasy stranger she had dreamed of all her childhood. I'm Gladys's daughter. Then she slumped and put the receiver back. Doherty wrote in his memoir of their marriage. She said, he hung up on me. The movie just had to tie so many of her reactions and decisions and emotional turbulence to outside forces, to things and people that were not her, to men, because they did not build her enough, they did not make her into enough of a character, they did not give her enough agency to tie anything she did or the way she felt to herself and her career, although that's how things actually were a lot of the time. They had to be connected to something external, her sexual experiences, her father, her pregnancy, her miscarriage, which did not even happen the way they made it seem. She had an ectopic pregnancy. Women have those. She did not trip and in her clumsiness lose a baby, Jesus Christ. This does not happen and when it does, it's not the mother's fault. But that's not how it happened. Her sexual assault, dramatized and fetishized for the screen. While ignoring the actual instance of the assault, she herself continues to recount and that clearly shaped so much of who she is. Mommy issues. How this movie failed, Marilyn's mom. I didn't actually have the section mapped out till I finished Steinem's Marilyn biography and it sank in how horribly this movie treats Marilyn's mother. I then decided it fit perfectly here because while Marilyn's dad is painted in a fairly passive light, where it's conveyed that yes, he abandoned her and her mother, there's very little other negativity surrounding him. Like I said, even the instance where she tried to reach out to him and was instantly shut out is omitted from the narrative. And with the way Marilyn's mother is misrepresented, the way she is portrayed in the movie, it feels almost like they're giving him a reason for why he would have abandoned them. In the movie, following the scene with Marilyn's father's picture on the wall, we get a scene where there are like wildfires and her mother tries to drive them up towards the wildfires before they're stopped by some, I don't know, park rangers, cops, whatever, men in uniform, who look at her with a combination of pity and disgust as she says she's going to see Marilyn's father, clearly heading towards the wildfires. They turn her back because, obviously, when they get home, she basically spirals. She tries to drown Marilyn and set the house on fire. It's all very weird. Andrew Dominic mentions a lot that he mostly cares about images more than anything else in the movie. A, I did not find this movie visually compelling enough to validate that statement and to justify how it betrays everything else in the process. And B, I do also think that was part of what happened here. Once again, I did not read Blonde. I made a conscious decision not to read Blonde, so I don't know exactly um, how this is described in the book. But these scenes with her mother seem more visuals than substance. The visuals of the fire and stuff, it's all very like horror movie e. It like reminded me of Hereditary a little bit. It's also similar to Hereditary in the sense that it's fictional and none of this really happened. 
I wanted to recount Marilyn's mother's actual story through Marilyn's own retellings and quotes from the biography I read, but that would be far too long, so here's a quick summary. The gist of it is yes, Marilyn's mother did appear to have issues. She did have what can only be described as a mental breakdown. She was unwell. According to Marilyn, her mother's husband left her and took their other children, Marilyn's older half-siblings with him. So she spent a significant amount of time trying to find them, and when she finally did, she saw them and they appeared to be happy and content without her, so she just left quietly, I'm sure absolutely devastated. There's also the fact that mental illness seems to run through her family, as her own mother faced some issues too. And based on some accounts, it, I, it sounds like she may have tried to suffocate Marilyn once, and Marilyn's mother saved her. So in all likelihood, her mother had no control over her mind betraying her as it seemed to, especially at that time, when mental health was handled even more poorly than it is now. But the decisions she took that were within her control, I think showcase her character the best. Making sure to pay neighboring families to be able to take care of Marilyn. Making sure her daughter is safe, even from her, and still not abandoning care for her despite the state she was in, even if she could only pay someone else to do it on her behalf. And in the brief times she did get well, she worked tirelessly and got a house for Marilyn and herself, just as she had promised her once. She went so far as to get Marilyn a piano as a present. As Marilyn tells it, her mother did work extremely hard to be able to do all that for her. And even when things got bad again, she didn't just immediately give up. She tried to find solutions and rent out rooms in the house, just to make sure that she is still able to care for Marilyn, and that they still have a home, and she can maintain her promise to her. But it appears that one day it was just all too much, and she broke. Her mental illness seemed to have caught up to her again, and that was when she got herself admitted. And yes, of course it's devastating for a child to be taken to an orphanage while her mother is still alive, but can't care for her. But she did try. She clearly tried very hard. She did not abandon her out of carelessness. She was not evil. She was not a villain trying to set herself and her daughter on fire. She was not a jaded, abandoned ex-lover. She was a troubled woman who was trying her very best for her daughter. And yes, it may be true that her best was not other mother's best, and she kind of failed to care for her in the end, but that's still no reason to turn her into a villain, while everyone else in Marilyn's life is afforded some depth to their motivations and actions, and are allowed to have some leeway in how harshly they are portrayed. The movie just handles Marilyn's mother with absolutely no nuance. She's afforded no measure of sympathy or understanding. No amount of compassion is lent to the woman whose last name Marilyn decided to adopt into her stage name. Despite her flaws, she just did not deserve to be portrayed in that manner. The movie paints her in such a villainous light that, at best, it's just poorly written, researched, and executed. And at worst, it's incredibly damaging and harmful. At the end of the day, I don't think we will ever have a full grasp of who Marilyn truly was. Because Marilyn herself seemed to have a lot of trouble figuring that out. But in this take on her life, there seems to be an absence of even the smallest attempt at getting to know her through her past experiences and all the information we have readily available on her. Because this movie decided that it would rather resort to fiction to portray her as the person they wanted her to be. A more appealing and more entertaining and more male gaze fulfilling fictional her. And fictional her appears to be a her who is very far from who she actually was. The problems with Blonde are highlighted and amplified when looked at through the lens of the biopics we got recently. Of the two most recent ones I watched, there is an incredibly jarring contrast between this movie and the way it treats Marilyn, and the way those movies glorify their subjects, where the liberties the narrative takes with the truth are used to benefit the subjects and the way they are viewed, rather than being to their detriment and painting them in a much worse light and tainting their memory. And whether those decisions were misguided or not, because I think in some cases they definitely very much were, and I'm not supporting the creators of these movies because... Mm. It is very obvious that the rationale behind them was for the benefit of the subject, to aid in the way they are perceived and remembered, rather than harm them at all. The movies also very clearly center the talent and status of their subjects, and their rise to the top to the narrative of the movie, as they should. That's exactly how it should be. Meanwhile, Blonde took Marilyn's talent, passion, and career, and made it literally the most unexplored, the most unimportant, and the most unimpressive and forgettable part of the movie. The worst part for me, the one where I feel the most guilt and therefore it inspires the most anger, is that I kind of fell for it, kind of, I feel like. And yeah, maybe that's my fault, but even watching it with all this like apprehension that eventually like, transformed into disdain, I could still sense my perception of Marilyn kind of shift. I could sense the movie filling in the blanks about her life that I was completely clueless about, but filling them in with the wrong answers, when I was consciously trying really hard not to let it do that. And those blanks remained filled with incorrect information and this inaccurate and horrible portrayal of Marilyn, right up until I decided to seek out actual biographies on her that could replace the misinformation with some truth. In the last interview before her death, Marilyn's press secretary remembers her pleading with the reporter to end his article in a particular way. She quotes her as saying, Please don't make me a joke. End the interview with what I believe. Despite her success that lives on to this day, 
Marilyn lived a despondent and lonely life, one that formed the damaged psyche that led to her tragically early demise. And one of her last requests following a life filled with emotional solitude, feelings of inadequacy, public scrutiny, exploitation, trauma, and abuse, was not to be made into a joke. The failure of Blonde is that it did not honor Marilyn's final wish. In fact, it seemed to be doing everything it can to go against it. The failure of Blonde is that it failed Marilyn. Alright, that's it. Thank you guys so much for watching. If all goes according to plan, this should be the second video up on my channel. I'm not planning to do this much rainy stuff, but um, there's already a video up if you want to go check that out. And there should be another video up around the same time next week if you guys want to subscribe. Um, and please let me know in the comments what topics you guys want to see or any suggestions you have or anything like that. I would appreciate it so much. And I will see you guys around the same time next week. Bye!